Implantable technology has become increasingly common for medical reasons. In 2004, the Food and Drug Administration in the US approved the use of the very chip. But eventually, this technology could be used for non-medical purposes too. You are not only a scientist who is working in this field at the University of Reading, but you have an implant yourself. Can you tell us about your research on implantable technology? Uh, the work that we're interested in at the University of Reading is um, implantable technologies. So we're particularly interested in uh, medical applications of implantable technology like um, cardiac pacemakers and deep brain stimulators. Um, and we're also interested in how this type of technology can ultimately be used outside of the medical context um, for enhancement. So what we're starting to see is a, a growing group of people who are willing to have um, invasive um, implants um, for some form of enhancement. And typically, at the moment, these tend to be very simple. Uh, they tend to be based on RFID type technologies, which originally was a, a technology used in animals for identifying the animal. Um, and it was a very simple number. It broadcast and you cross-reference that with a, uh, with a database. Um, that technology has come a long way over the last 10, 15 years. And now really these um, devices are more like um, very simple computers. So they can do very simple computations and they can store data. So people have had them implanted. Um, I have one implanted in my hand, which you probably can't quite see just here. So it's just oh. here, you oh. just see a little lump under the oh, skin yeah. there. Um, the procedure is very simple. It's uh, an injection, uh, a syringe type device to inject it under the skin. Um, and it sits there, I don't really notice it, um, I don't feel it, um, it doesn't interact with my body in any way. Um, but I've used it to gain access to um, a building, I can use it for, um, when I use my mobile phone, the phone can detect that it's me because it can read the chip. So the phone will only work if I'm holding it uh, in this hand. If I hold it in this hand or someone takes my phone, uh, then it just won't work. So these are very simple security type applications for this technology. Um, what we're interested in is how the medical applications of implantable technology and these simple uh, applications for healthy people may converge in the future and we redeploy this technology for enhancement. So if, for example, we took deep brain stimulation, which is uh, a therapy used in Parkinson's disease to stimulate part of the brain to stop the tremor associated with Parkinson's, now, this is a very invasive procedure. Uh, an electrode is literally placed into the centre of the brain and a cable is run down and a, a pacemaker pat pack is put in the chest with a little computer and battery pack in it. And it literally sits there stimulating the brain to stop that part of the brain from really functioning at all. But that stops the tremor. There is some anecdotal evidence from some patients in America that... Um, having deep brain stimulation, and in one case it was for Tourette's and not Parkinson's, um, actually made the person more creative. So the, this particular patient was a graphic designer by trade, um, and their employer noticed that when the, the stimulator was being used in a certain way, the um, results of the patient's um, graphic design work actually improved. So this is all very anecdotal, and unfortunately we can't just take someone's brain and start sticking electrodes in to find out uh, what happens when we stimulate certain regions. And we're not really sure why um, this phenomenon happens at all, mainly because our understanding of the brain is uh, surprisingly limited. Um, we don't know how the electrical activity that we can manipulate actually um, results in these higher level behaviours that we have, creativity, um, intelligence, but it opens up the possibilities that we could develop technologies that can interact with the brain on an intimate level in order to perhaps increase someone's IQ, perhaps increase their memory in some way. Now we're fairly convinced that um, people will undergo fairly invasive procedures if there's some sort of gain for them. Um, certainly cosmetic surgery has shown us that people will undergo very invasive procedures for um, essentially some physical net gain. Um, so we can't rule out that people um, won't uh, 
we can't rule out that people will have this type of procedure because it's invasive, because it already happens in a different context at the moment.